Hello, my name is Kevin Fuentes, and today I will be discussing control design for a heat exchanger on an oxygen production system. Here we have a general overview of my presentation going from the problem statement to designing the actual control. In order to design a control, you need to have a system, and our system in this case is a heat exchanger, and we will be going over a derivation of the mass and energy balance to do so. Here we have an oxygen production system with a preheater. An example of a oxygen production system is a SOE or a solid oxide electrolyzer. Going through the diagram you have atmospheric air going through the high powered heater. The purpose of the heater is to heat up air to operational temperature. Depending on the, the system, operational temperature can be 500 to 800 degrees Celsius. Now the heated air goes into the cathode and through a process called electrolysis, O2 is diffused through a membrane and is released through the anode. And through this process, you, your output is oxygen, some form of electricity, and you have your remainder of the air. Now the main focus of this presentation is this high power heater and trying to make the oxygen production system more efficient. It has been proposed to use hot exhaust air alongside a heat exchanger to heat up atmospheric air initially before reaching the power heater. The reason you do this is you're recycling heat and then less energy is required to heat up initial atmospheric air to, to operational temperature. Now you may be asking yourself, why is this important? Why should we study this? The oxygen production system is a means of creating oxygen efficiently with clean energy. But the current downfall of the system, which makes the system very inefficient, is high operational temperatures. But by using a heat exchanger, you reduce the overall energy needed, making the system more efficient. And some use cases for, for this oxygen production system for the controller for the heat exchanger is oxygen production in the case of a natural disaster or even colonizing Mars. Going on to the next slide, you see our main focus. You have a heat exchanger, and now instead of having a high power heater, you have a low power heater. By having a low powered heater in tangent with the heat exchanger, less energy is required to jump up atmospheric pressure to or atmospheric air to operational temperature and then following along the diagram the same suit follows from the last slide going on to the next slide we have a simple heat exchanger model for our heat recovery unit um, and, and our heat exchanger will consist of a shell and tube we have atmospheric air going into the shell side whereas I exhaust air from our cathode from the O2 recovery unit will be in our tubes. There's a few assumptions that needs to be made and will be discussed in the next slide, but the ones that we can see right here that the system is well mixed. And we also have to assume that the system is adiabatic, so heat is being transferred within the two systems, and that's why we have this Q. And no heat is being lost to outside sources. Going back to the well mixed statement, that means for our control volume, we'll have one constant temperature. Another assumption that we are making that our control volume is the same temperature as our outlet temperature. And going to our assumptions, I mentioned a few of these, but to point out a few ones, uh, the flow is fully developed, no mass accumulation in the control volume, The there is a constant and low conduction resistance, meaning all of our heat transfer, or majority of our heat transfer comes from convection. No external work. And we are going to finally assume that the shell and tube are in counterflow configuration. Going into our mass balance, as you can see, you have the general mass balance equation. And since there is no mass accumulation, this dm over dt goes away and then we have our mass going in has to equal our mass going out and these are our mass flow rates for our shell and tubes going to our fluid properties and you can see the nomenclature that we're using and the symbols all these values are considered constants in our analysis and do not change 
All right, going to our energy balance. So we have a general energy balance equation shown on top. And for our Q, we are using the AMTD method. We multiply our surface area and our conduction coefficient to our AMTD. And the AMTD is just a means of an average temperatures and approximations of our tube inlets divided by 2 subtracted by our, our shell outlets divided by 2. And as you can see, we have enthalpy rate, which is our mass flow rate, times enthalpy. And we're breaking down enthalpy to our specific heat times a differential in temperature. And since we assume there's no external work, our W dot is equal to zero. Going on, we derive a energy balance for the shell and tube. They are very similar. The only difference is one system is gaining heat and the other is losing heat. So there's going to be a difference in Q, whereas the tube is losing heat, it will be a minus sign, and the shell is gaining heat, so it will be a plus sign. And since we have a s dynamic model, we can derive a steady state model by setting our derivative terms to zero. And the nomenclature for this one, for our steady state terms, we put a bar on top, uh, and the other values are just constants. And using a normalization process, we can subtract our steady state model or we will subtract our dynamic model from our steady state to get a normalized model. And from this, we can get our deviation state variables, as you can see. So, And the reason we normalize it is so you can get your model to start at zero whenever you plot it. Now, having two equations, we can use a state space uh, model to graph our, our system. Now state space is used to describe input and output as certain variables. So in this case our input variables would be our temperature for our shell and tubes and as you can see they're described as theta 1 and theta 2 and our output what we want to see is our theta 2 and theta 4. And since we have multiple inputs and we only care about the shell, we have a MISO system, a multiple input, single output. And using our energy balance, you can, you can plug those variables into our state space model. And from here, knowing the model, we can use Simulink, a MATLAB add-in to plot these. And so, as you can see in the bottom figure, we have a our model based off Simulink. We have a sh our shell input, which, as you can see, which is the red line, have a 50 degree input, and our actual output is about 9 degrees Celsius, which is not good. This is not what we want, and this is where our PID or our control design comes in, and all of our outputs or all of our tube outputs or inputs, I'm sorry, all of our tube inputs would be zero and in all the scenarios our shell inputs would be 50. And so going on for our control design, something that we need, we need to have zero overshoot, we need to have 2% or less steady state error, uh, no rapid change in temperatures, we don't want no need we do not want a step function or a massive hike. And following, we want to have steady state in less than three hours. So as you can see, once we did a closed loop response with a proportional controller, you get a massive spike. The reaction time is, as you can see, is maybe twenty less than 20 seconds, but it still doesn't reach steady state or our 2% steady state value with a proportional controller of 50. So it doesn't satisfy our design criteria. And so going on, when using a proportional and integral controller based off these numerical values, uh, the response of the system acts well. There's zero overshoot and the system reaches steady state and has a less than 2% steady state error, which is what we want. The only downside of the system is that 
the response time is too fast. We were looking for something around three hours, less than three hours, but close to three hours and not a, a response time within a few minutes. Um, the reason that we don't want a response time that's so fast is not the actual system will not respond that quickly. Whenever using the PID tuning application on Simulink, in order to get a steady state response of around three hours, all proportional controller has to go to zero, which leads to the next slide. And so we can actually control when the system reaches steady state by manipulating the integral controller and setting the proportional and derivative terms equal to zero. And so if you want a quicker response, relatively quicker response, you can reduce or increase the value of the integral controller which will which will um decrease the amount of time in which the system in which the system reaches steady state now looking at how the system reacts with a PID controller as you can see on this slide the system behaves well relatively well the the problem is well, the the system actually doesn't behave the way that we want it to at all. There is 2% steady state error or less than 2% steady state error, but the system just reacts too fast. Um, the derivative term helps the integral control, the inter the integral controller, and so you're really knocking down the response time, and you get this overshoot, and we don't want the system to go higher than we actually want. So, in order to fit our design criteria, we have to just use an integral controller or we have to change some design parameters. And so, based off all of this information that we have gathered, we have designed a controller for a heat exchanger system. We also developed a, a model for both shell and tube in order to design the control for the system. Um, we also did PID tuning to get the response that we desire and looked how the system responded based off a set point. And here are my references. We and thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please email me or contact me. Um have a nice day.